Hi, my name is Brooke Whalen, and I will be reading from 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 1-2 through 2 and 5-12. through 12. Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh king of Egypt and married his daughter. He brought her to the city of David until he finished building his palace and the temple of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. The people, however, were still sacrificing at the high places because a temple had not yet been built for the name of the Lord. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, Ask for whatever you want me to give you. Solomon answered, You have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now, Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, but I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, Since you have asked for this, and not for long life or wealth for yourself, not nor have asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment and administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart, so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, uh, thank you, Brooke, for, uh, for that reading this morning. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we thank, we're thankful for this day. Please let us feel the presence of your Spirit here among us, those who are worshiping together, and those who are worshiping at home, wherever they may be. Let, that, let the presence of your Spirit bless us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So yes, we're going to continue the story, the king who had it all, and today's account begins with God giving Solomon a wish. So, so if God gave you a wish, what would it be? Partic- and, and let's change it to where if God gave you the wish, nobody else knew what the wish would be, okay? What would that wish actually be? Now, I'm not going to ask you to write it down and pass it in today. So just, just kind of hang on to that. Solomon asked God for wisdom. And today we're going to see how God, or how Solomon used that gift. We're in, uh, we're in this, this arc here where Israel, in the story where Israel's sort of hitting a high point. The, the country is in its salad days. This is, uh, this is about as good as it gets for the nation of Israel. David's reign is coming to an end. Israel is taking its place among the nations, all right? And this was, if if you remember, this is what Israel wanted when they said, God, give us a king. God reluctantly said, okay, all right, I'll give you a king, because Israel wanted to be like all the other nations. And so now we see that that coming to pass. Solomon's story, if you've uh, if you followed along, is one of, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a full story. Um, in brief, it's a little bit interesting at the beginning, if you notice, um, Solomon needed an assist from his mom to become king, right? There was a, someone else had sort of usurped the throne, and then Bathsheba said, well, no, no, Solomon, Solomon, you're, you're the one. And so he becomes the regent and then sort of grows into, into being the king. He's a thoughtful judge. He's an able diplomat. He's a shrewd negotiator. He's an accomplished administrator. We're, uh, we can look at the story of him adjudicating the, uh, the story or the, the problem with the two women and the, and the baby, right? You remember that one? That's a famous story where, where uh, the two women are arguing over an infant and then Solomon says, well, I have a solution, and we're going to just cut the infant in half, right? And then we'll, and then, and we'll give each of you half. And the, and the mother says, no, no, I'll give up my half. Now, it's a, it's a sermon for another day, right, to, to sort of deal with folks who always want to cut the baby in half, right? And, all right, so we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna push, push that one off a little bit. But Solomon is shown to be a thoughtful judge. 
He's also an able diplomat, right? Israel um, ends up, I mean, this is kind of amazing. It's, I think it's the only time it's, it's noted in Scripture. I, Israel ends up with a navy because of Solomon's diplomatic skill. He, uh, he negotiates with Hiram of Tyre, and Tyre, this is a Phoenician, uh, Phoenician monarch, and they're able sailors, and so at the end of all of this, Solomon ends up with a navy, some, with, with ships that go out and get, uh, and get trade and bring tribute back. He's also a shrewd negotiator, as I said. The Queen of Sheba comes to town, and I don't know about you, I think about the Queen of Sheba, I think this sort of really exotic kind of, you know, cue the interesting music, you know. Uh, so the Queen of Sheba comes to town, but she's skeptical about um, Solomon's wisdom. But in their interchange, she leaves convinced that Solomon is basically the wisest man that there ever was. And she pays tribute to him. And he's also an accomplished administrator, as I said. A lot of building goes on in Solomon's reign. The walls around Jerusalem, his own palace, and eventually, of course, the crown jewel of this whole effort, the temple. So he's an accomplished administrator. Now, there's also taxes and conscripted labor, okay? So where government, when government starts, can taxes be far behind, right? But his ability as an administrator is really unparalleled. And don't forget the Proverbs. Here's a couple. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Wisdom will save you from the ways of wicked men. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. Solomon's story is really one of success and excess, if you think about it. I mean, we've noted his successes. Um, the successful coup that started it. The 12, he established 12 administrative districts. He entered into alliances across the region with Moabites and Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, Hittites. The list is in the story and in the temple, of course. But to go along with the successes, Solomon had his excesses, right? He spoke 3,000 proverbs. 3,000 proverbs. He penned 1,005 songs. Not 1,000 songs, but 1,005 songs. Okay, It was five extra songs. That's, that's the bonus. All right, the bonus songs. Now think of Proverbs maybe as, as Solomon's greatest hits because there's only 800 Proverbs in Proverbs, right? He was a great naturalist. He imported apes and baboons, just all these exotic animals. The tales of his sacrifice, he sacrificed so many sheep and cattle that they couldn't be counted. When the temple was dedicated, Solomon sacrificed 22,000 cattle and 120,000 sheep. He received 666, there's an interesting number, gold talents a year in tribute. That's about 16 years, a talent is 16 years wages. So he, he was rolling, okay. His throne was covered with ivory and overlaid with gold. Twelve lions were on each step. And they didn't even mess around with silver because it was too common. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines, which is sort of an assistant wife. So picture Solomon. He comes home from a hard day. Honeys, I'm home. And they're like, he has a thousand wives saying, honey, tell us about your day, right? So, excess. Excess. Success and excess in combination, I think, can, can spell trouble, and surely this is what happened to Solomon, right? In the, in the passage that was read, that Brooke read for us, you can kind of see some hints of the trouble that is to come. In Deuteronomy, God expressly forbids returning to Egypt. And that's kind of a, a, a euphemism or it's symbolic of entering into alliances. And then God expressly forbids intermarrying for the purpose of alliance. You can bet some of the 700 wives and 300 concubines were part of his, Solomon's strategy of alliance through marriage. Notice that 
when they're talking about his building projects, he hasn't gotten around to building the temple, so people are having to sacrifice in the high places. Gibeon is a high place, and Gibeon is, 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 think about it, it's sort of like a drive-in altar, okay? It's a high place, it's convenient for, for, for sacrifice, but there were sacrifices to all kinds of gods going on at Gibeon, to the one true God, but also all the other gods. And then later, we read in Kings that he did spend seven years on the temple. That was good. But he spent 13 years on his own palace. And he did that first. So yes, there's some, there's some cracks, there's some chinks here in the armor. Now, we're no strangers to success and excess, right? Um, we're the most educated generation, right, in the, wor- in, in the United States, right? We're the, this is the most educated generation. We have, uh, let me see, 4.5 million people with doctoral degrees. Holy cow, yeah. Now, well, again, that's a, a sermon for another day about how much wisdom abounds, right, in the midst of all this education, but certainly much education. There are almost 19 million millionaires in the United States. Wow. And we had some recent successes, of course. We were thankfully looking at a COVID vaccine that's over 90 plus percent effective. I I think that's a success. Brought Brought to bear in record time. And then, of course, you know, another success is the NBA played a whole season without one COVID uh, case. So, friends, that's, that's remarkable. There's also some excesses. I was reading this morning in the paper, um, Black, Fi- Black Friday spending. Did you see this? It was $9 billion. $9 billion. They got some of mine, maybe some of yours, eh? 22% increase over last year. Wow. And and if you were looking online, maybe you could, I mean, you could buy buy one of these uh, uh, things from Neiman Marcus's Fantasy Luxury Gifts. You could buy a travel trailer for $255,000. It's outfitted like a yacht, okay, on the inside. Um... You could get a year of beef tenderloin. It's really good. It's $185,000. This is a real gift, okay? Supermarkets throw away 42 billion tons or pounds of food a year. Much of it is produce because it's ugly. It's not even spoiled. And then maybe the, I don't know, the crowning achievement of our, of our, re- of our recent excess... Uh, in the 2020 presidential and congressional elections, spending during that, those elections, this will, this will blow your mind, $14 billion. Yeah, that's worth a head shake or two, isn't it? Wow. We also have our modern proverbs. I picked a couple of these from the IT world. Uh, when we were doing the rehearsal, these didn't, these, these didn't go over very well. So let's see if you all are, are a little more awake. Let's see. Truth is stranger than Photoshop. Thank you. Thank you. That was good. A watched update never loads. Yeah, I have a computer like that at home. Nothing good can come from answering a landline. Right? Because they want to sell you a what? A car warranty. Yes. An extended warranty for your car. Tweet in haste. Regret immediately. Mm -hmm. Power corrupts. Absolute power keeps your cell phone fully charged. I have a phone like that. The battery's starting to fail. If at first you don't succeed, try turning it on and off again. Okay. So we have our modern proverbs. Solomon, if you've taken the story all the way to the end, you see that he loses the kingdom, everything that he had, because he lived according to his own conventional wisdom, right? 
he got distracted by the trappings of his office, all the work that he had to do. He was so busy, his foreign alliances gave way to foreign faiths. And he replaced his sayings of eternal wisdom with a piece of wisdom that's more conventional. Frank, frankly, he said, the perfect is the enemy of the good. I'm going to make a compromise here and a compromise there. But I'm going to make my big showy sacrifices on Sunday, but I'm going to have my foreign alliances during the rest of the week. Solomon had a heart problem. In the story it says, as Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods. The works and the planning and the wealth didn't matter because his heart wasn't in it. Maybe he thought his heart would come along later. But it didn't. He forgot his own proverbs. Here's a couple. A person may think their own ways are right, but the Lord weighs the heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not rely on your own insights. Yes, Solomon had a heart problem, and because of the heart problem, Israel becomes first a divided nation, then it's overrun by the Assyrians, and then the Babylonians, and then the people are in exile, the temple is destroyed, the walls of Jerusalem are torn down. Tune in in 2021 for the next installment, right? It's coming. There's this tension between the world and the kingdom of God. Yes? Jesus had a familiar way of talking about this. And and actually, we talk about it. I mean, maybe you've heard this. I heard this growing up in Calvary Baptist Church in San Antonio, Texas. Christians are supposed to be in the world and not of the world, right? Can I get a witness? Anybody? Okay. Thank you. But Jesus put it this way. If you lived on the world's terms, the world would love you as one of its own. But since I picked you to live on God's terms and no longer on the world's terms, the world is going to hate you. Pretty strong language from Jesus. But the point is, is this opposition, this tension between the world and the kingdom of God is profound. You know, the heart comes first. What did Jesus say? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength. And your neighbor is yourself. The heart is first. He also said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So if Solomon, with all of his assets, his wisdom and his influence and his wealth and his power, His navy (laughs) falls short. What are we to do? How do we avoid Solomon's heart problem? John Wesley had uh, some things to say about this. He he, um, talked, preached a lot about grace. And his construct of grace is, is one that we, we, we continue. This notion of prevenient grace, the grace that comes before us, before we were even born, this notion of justifying grace that, that sort of saves us. And then, finally, sanctifying grace, the grace that helps make us holy. The metaphor, of course, is that the prevenient grace is the porch of the house, inviting us in. Justifying grace is the doorway that we step through. And then sanctifying grace are the rooms of the house where we live. And so, this this sanctifying grace is the key to this change of heart that we're talking about. Wesley said that there's four... And this is going to get real practical, okay? I I don't have any magic for you this morning, but this is very practical. Wesley said there's four areas of our life where we can open our hearts to experience the sanctifying grace 
Four areas. Worship, devotion, justice, and compassion. Four areas. Pretty simple. Paul said to the Romans, and this is from the message, I kind of like this, uh, this paraphrase. He said, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. So friends, I guess I'm asking you to think about in this season of Advent, this season where we are saying, Lord Jesus, come. Are you up for a change? How about worship? What if you were to set a goal to increase your participation in worship? I know I'm preaching to the choir, not the choir, but the congregation. You all are here. So if, you, if you've been to worship two Sundays in a row, maybe you make it three, maybe you make it four. It's hard during COVID. I get it. But what if you were to increase your participation in worship? What about devotion? You know, devotion is about prayer. Devotion is about those, that small group study. What if you added a time of prayer every day? Adam Hamilton has a nice system. Five time, pray five times a day. Pray when you get up. Pray at breakfast. Pray at, pray, at, pray at the noon meal. Pray at dinner and pray before you go to bed. Five little prayers. In the justice area, we have a little work to do as a society. Where will you make your mark in this time of realizing greater social justice? Actually, today is, a, is the November Unity Meal. This is sponsored by uh, One Community Church, and we are, we are a participating church. So if you're interested in having a Zoom meal with someone who looks different than you, sign up for that today. You can, I mean, we're sort of, you're sort of sharing a meal. COVID's making this hard. But you'll be inspired by the conversation. You know, uh, Cornell West said, justice is, what look, look, what, justice is what love looks like in public. And then finally, this notion of compassion. Wesley he had a famous sermon about, about visiting the sick, and he said, look, when you're ministering to others, being face-to-face with them, is, there's really no substitute for that, right? Ministering in person. So think about how you might do that. We're going to continue to do our food distribution every week with Trinity Presbyterian. That's going to be Saturday morning. We start about 8.30. We finish at 11. If you have a Saturday morning, and you want to get face-to-face with those in need, sign up and do that. Join us. So there is no magic to increasing our openness to sanctifying grace. Right? It's about how we behave, how we act, how we live every single day. Now, thankfully... Thankfully, we're all in this together. Wesley also said, there's no holiness except social holiness. Now, I know when we talk about being holy, we get all uncomfortable because it's like, I don't know that I can be holy. Well, no, you can't be holy. I can't be holy. But through God's sanctifying grace, we can be holy, together. The social holiness means we are in a, we're not on a journey by ourselves. We're on a journey with, with others. We are all in this together. Turn to your neighbor and say, we're all in this together. Yeah, we're all in this together. The pastors are here. Pastor Bob, Pastor Jana, myself, Pastor Jeff, we're here to help. We are meant to help each other. You know, the Christian walk is more than an hour a week. We get 168 hours in a week, right? One hour a week for worship, but there's more to it than that. 
It's more than a lifestyle choice, it's a life. Solomon was, was laid low by his conventional wisdom that, that settled, basically, that said, uh, why strive for perfection? The perfect's the enemy of the good. Let's get some things done. And you know, I've, in my administrative life, I've spent 30 years in higher education as an administrator at colleges and universities, and I have said that, I have uttered that phrase my entire career, because I, I always wanted to get some stuff done. And there's nothing wrong with getting stuff done. But we are called, in this Christian journey, among the stuff we are to get done, is this notion of pure Christian love. And we're not going to get there by ourselves. We're going to get there through an openness to God's sanctifying grace. Jesus said this. He said, in a word, what I'm saying is that your kingdom subjects now live like it. Live out your God-created identity. Live generously and graciously toward others the way God lives toward you. We may have learned this verse in the old King James's, be ye therefore perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. So, friends, God does have a wish for you today. The wish is that you live abundantly, that you live in communion with God and with each other. Charles Wesley's hymn describes it best. Finish then thy new creation, pure and spotless let us be. Let us see thy great salvation perfectly restored in thee, changed from glory into glory, till in heaven we take our place, till we cast our crowns before thee, lost in wonder, love, and praise. Let it be so. Let's pray. Gracious God, Open our hearts to your sanctifying grace. Let us grab it and hold it and share it and live it. In the name of Jesus, the Christ, we pray. Amen.